that would be great. Well, good. Welcome, everyone. We're so thrilled to have you. Um, this is like the all-star cast of Pisgah Legal Services supporters from Marianne Lowry in Hendersonville to Bernie Arguer, and I'm going to leave, off all, leave out all kinds of people, but I see um, a wonderful list of folks. And um, as frustrating it is that we haven't been able to see you sooner this year, it's nice to be able to see you now. And um, we have a great team that's going to talk about um, some charitable giving tools that maybe you're not aware of. And I wanted to let you know how um, busy Pisgah Legal Services is these days, as you can imagine. We are, um, we consider ourselves at ex experts and, and fully um, versed in helping people through financial crises, because that's what Pisgah Legal Services does, whether the unemployment rate is 3% or 15% or 10%. But it has been very difficult in this environment, as you can imagine, everybody's working from home, except people who have to go to court. And we're um, seeing huge increases in need, a thousand calls a week on average for our help. And we're just stretched to the limit. We're using more volunteer lawyers and um, that's hard for everybody because it's remote, they're remote also. Um, but we're, doing great stuff and we're helping more people with um, financial assistance than normal because of the CARES Act money that's finally flowing through to the local governments. We're helping people who need that rental assistance to um, sustain their, their housing longer because we're trying to negotiate longer leases in exchange for catching up on the rent. And they have all kinds of other issues Every time there's a recession, you see a lot of people who had been working and have lost their jobs and are not very well equipped to deal with that. So um, we're also in the middle of open enrollment to make things more challenging for ACA health insurance. And this is a big opportunity for people who are concerned about COVID-19, who have underlying conditions but have lost their health insurance because they lost their employment or people who are just now motivated to find out about health insurance because of the virus. So it's, it's a very busy time for us and we just can't thank you enough for supporting us and sustaining this work and um, helping us have the expert uh, staff who are available to help people. And we've, you'll be glad to know that we've gotten some additional funding from Dogwood Health Trust recently to add some staff. So if you're looking at our website, you'll see we're hiring more people than usual because of the additional funding we're getting related to COVID-19. And we can't get those people on board soon enough and train them soon enough. So thank you all for sustaining the staff that we have and, and um, making it possible to add more capacity right now. So um, I think Jackie is going to introduce our I mean, um, Allie's yep. going to introduce nope. Jackie and the other people. <laughs> so, I can just take Jackie, over. Maybe, maybe Jackie's going to do it. Yeah. I am. <laughs> I'm just going to do a brief introduction, make a couple of comments, and then hand it over to Cheryl and Bray, and all three of us will be in on the conversation. Um, I'm Jackie Frederick, uh, an advisor at Alta Vista Wealth Management. I'm also the chair of the investment committee for the endowment for Pisgah Legal. Um, got involved with Pisgah when they lost the funding for um, domestic violence and, and then just got sucked in and really involved and, and loved the organization. Um, Cheryl and I started talking, I think about two years ago about some of the tax law changes and how that was gonna affect some of our nonprofits. We were concerned that people thought if they weren't gonna have the deduction that they wouldn't make the contribution. So we started doing this, this kind of little thing a couple of years ago, just to give options on what you can do. And Bray um, Creech is gonna also talk about some of the impacts of the, of the tax law changes. But so Cheryl Aikman is with Alunda Consulting. She was with um, Community Foundation. She's gonna talk a little bit about what her services are when she starts the program. And Bray Creech is with the Joel Adams office of Raymond James. He's been an advisor, he's a CFP and a CPA. So lots of 
great knowledge there. Excited to have him join us this year. Um, so one thing you're going to hear us say throughout the presentation is we're giving you ideas, but your advisory team, your attorney, your CPA, your financial planner, that's the team, other consultants, th those are the, the team players that need to kind of get into the weeds with you. We just want to give you ideas so that you know what's possible for 2020 and 2021. So here is Cheryl. Thank you, Jackie. I'm so glad to be here. I wanna thank Ali for inviting us once again, uh, for, for Jim Barrett letting, us, letting Ali invite us once again, and, <laughs> and um, to the staff, all the other staff members at Pisgah Legal who are helping, uh, who helped promote this um, get together and are making it possible uh, with technology. Um, that is, uh, that, that, that's indispensable these days. Um, and uh, I'm also really glad to have Bray along with us today as well. Um, Jackie's kind enough to invite me to say a little bit about Alenda Consulting. Um, for those of you who've been out of Latin class uh, for a while, um, Alenda means source. Um, and I believe that philanthropy is a source of joy for us as individuals um, and of vitality for our communities and for the causes uh, that we most value um, and can also be a source of peace when we use philanthropy as a component of our planning for a legacy, for our family's security um, and for the future that we would like to see. So that is, the, that is the reason for the name of my firm. Um, and I am doing a variety of things with individuals. I am uh, continuing to have the philanthropic conversation and to support philanthropic planning um, and visioning for individuals um, who are eager to d dive into a more uh, thoughtful planning position, whether that's for um, for immediate implementation or as part of a longer vision. Um, and just as Jackie said, I'm one component of uh, a plan and the planning I do really is then uh, implemented and vetted and um, adjusted uh, for uh, my clients' personal circumstances by their team of advisors to best match their personal circumstances. It's great work. I'm thrilled to be doing it um, um, and, uh, and really excited about um, doing more and more of that here in our community. Uh, it's a great privilege to be part of those conversations with folks. Um, with that, I think we should, we should jump in. Um, we're going to start with some ideas for 2020. As the title of the presentation indicates, um, there are, a, there are a, few, a few weeks left um, and there are some ways to give that are unique for this year um, and that may give you an opportunity to uh, add a little extra generosity for the organizations like Pisgah Legal that have absolutely stepped up to our uh, community's unbelievably wide variety of needs that the pandemic has brought. Housing, food, uh, care for children, um, the ability to have children continue to learn when parents are out of the home working and, and school is remote. Um, all of those things, it is the nonprofits and the charitable organizations of our community who have stepped into the breach, um, who stepped in um, in the first days of this in March and who have stayed there and been steadfast and, um, and adjusted. Uh, what they're doing and what they're able to do throughout. So gifts from your wallet. Um, your wallet includes cash. I don't know anybody who's touched a piece of cash in the last seven months, um, except my daughter who has a dog walking business that's very lucrative. She seems to always have cash. Um, gifts from your checkbook uh, and gifts you make by credit card. So credit cards count the same as, as cash in terms of how um, how they're looked at uh, it, for tax purposes. Um, the big opportunity between now and the end of 2020 is something that was in the CARES Act. It is a unique opportunity um, that was started for this year. We hope it will go forward. 
And that is a $300 off the top deduction for every taxpayer for gifts to charity. Typically, if you don't itemize your tax return, you cannot take charitable deductions. That was a law change from a few years ago um, that changed the landscape for a lot of people in terms of how they thought about their giving and um, thought about that on a year to year basis. Um, but this, this year they implemented this giving opportunity that works for all. It is a deduction per what they're calling a tax paying unit. So if you are a couple who files a joint return, the limit is still $300. It's not $300 per person, um, but it do, does give you the opportunity to make um, a gift of up to that amount and take a deduction um, in a spot that'll be right at the top of your 2020 tax form. The other opportunity, um, if you are giving at a, a, um, a more significant level, or if you have the opportunity to do that uh, as the end of the year approaches, and this is only for 2020, we don't expect it to be carried over, is that you can deduct up to 100% of your adjusted gross income against charitable gifts of, that you've made in cash. So gifts that you've made directly from your bank account to a qualified charity. Those gifts can't be to a donor advised fund or another sort of formal philanthropic structure. They do need to be directly to a charity such as Pisgah Legal. Um, but that is a giving opportunity that for some may represent a way to make a very significant gift um, in 2020 um, that also is tax advantaged in a unique way for this year. Cheryl, can I interrupt and ask a question? Of course. So Bray, what's the difference? What was the law compared to what it, it I mean, what it is for this year? So last year, um, and, and, and last year means we were under the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017, but, but last year, if you were making gifts of cash, you could deduct up to 60% of your adjusted gross income. Then coronavirus happened, then Congress met and passed the CARES Act, and I guess recognized that charities now need us more than ever. So they said, let's do now, instead of 60% AGI, let's do 100% AGI, adjusted gross income in 2020 for gifts of cash to, to charity uh, in recognition of the circumstances we were in. So that, that is the difference. It, it's a very generous yep. tax law. All right. You want to tell us who you are and about where you work? I'm uh, Bray Creech, nice to be with you. I'm with uh, Joel Adams and Associates, Raymond James Financial Services. Um, we are, our firm, Joel Adams and Associates are big supporters of uh, Pisgah Legal Services and like everyone on this call is. So we're delighted to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Bray. Um, we're gonna be back with Bray in just a second because we're, we're gonna now talk about gifts from your investments. Um, so these are, are gifts made from stocks and mutual funds that you hold uh, from your IRA or other retirement account. One of the things about using particularly stocks or mutual funds uh, as a giving tool is that when you give the shares directly to a charity, when you transfer the ownership of the shares, um, not selling them and then giving the proceeds, but literally giving the shares over, um, there is no capital gains tax due for that gift. Charities are tax exempt, so they can receive those shares, sell them, and don't have to make a corresponding uh, tax payment representing the capital gain embedded in an appreciated security. Um, I wanted Jackie to talk for a minute about um, if, if this is a smart way of giving for you, if you have some um, things in your portfolio that have appreciated, many of us do because the stock market um, didn't do what we all thought it would, um, or at least didn't stay um, in a depressed uh, position. It has actually uh, reached um, amazing 
heights um, and seems to have stabilized uh, in, that, in that way, looking at the end of the year. Um, Jackie, what, what should people literally say to their advisor? And Bray, you can argue with Jackie about this because you're in this <laughs> position too, um, to, to indicate that they'd like to look for a holding in their portfolio that would be appropriate to use this way. Like, what are the words? What do I say sure. to, my, to my Jackie or to my Bray? Sure, sure. So I think that the, you know, first sign is I want to make that gift and I have appreciated stock and it's very easy. You call your advisor and, and ask the advisor, which, which position should I use to make this gift? I want to make a gift of $20,000 to my church. You pick out which gift and the advisor can do that. Um, the key is asking your advisor. We find sometimes that we've got clients who are reviewing tax returns and we see they made a $20,000 cash gift. And that could have been, we could have handled that in a better tax efficient way by giving a, a low basis stock. So I think if you wanna make a gift, talk to your financial advisor, your investment advisor, and let them pick it out. And they can, they can gift that stock, yeah, Apple. We've been giving away some Apple. Um, they can gift that stock and buy it right back for you. So you still have exposure, but you've gotten the gain out of the portfolio and then you reset your basis. What do you think, Bray? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And um, the, the security has to be held long-term. Uh, we don't wanna do that with securities held short-term, which is basically a security held less than a year. Um, one, one thing to be aware of, if, if your security, the stock is usually what I see instead of bonds, but the stock, if it's in, a, if it's in a, some sort of a managed account where um, if, if that security leaves the account, let's say it's Apple to keep Jackie's um, example, the, whoever's managing the account may want to rebalance the account to get it back to where they wanted it to be. So... So the act of taking it out could, and this is a discussion with your financial advisor, uh, but the act of taking it out could trigger um, a rebalance that may have a little tax consequence associated with it. And that, that would be a question to discuss with your advisor. So um, Jackie or Bray, whoever jumps in first, what do I do if I have, um, if I pick something that hasn't had such a great uh, run and I've decided that uh, I want that stock out, but it's a it's a losing a loser position. What's the strategy there? I wouldn't do it. <laughs> it, it you want to take the loss by selling the stock. Bray can talk about that more. Don't don't give don't give a stock away that has um, a loss in it. There's other tax advantage things we can do. Yeah, absolutely. If you have a loss, you take it. That's that's the smart way to do it. That's the smart way to do it. Good. Thank you. I, that was what I was hoping you would both say. That's what. I, <laughs> um, so, but but there are ways to work with your advisor and a charitable giving strategy to to um, adjust your portfolio. Um, and Bray talked about rebalancing and. Um, and Jackie talked about maybe doing buying uh, the position back if it's something that, if it's a, if it's a something you believe in and it's done well for you and that your advisor believes you should continue to be exposed to, um, and you can do all of that um, embedded with a strategy of using these assets for giving. The other thing that using uh, particularly stocks or mutual fund shares may allow you to do is a strategy called bunching. So many of us now, many more of us than two years ago, use the standard deduction. Um, you may be able to, by um, using a donor advised fund, making a much more significant range of charitable gifts than you, um, than you would in any single year, um, or even just taking advantage of this year's um, healthy stock market performance and investment performance, um, bunch together some charitable deductions, support for a number of charities in this year, in 2020, uh, that will allow you to uh, itemize your taxes and use uh, those deductions, perhaps take advantage of that 100% deduction um, for cash, given the strategy. Um, and then maybe in the coming year, um, you won't have as many gifts or won't have as many things to itemize, um, but you've 
but you've taken advantage of that this year and can let it go next year and the year after. Um, it's, a way, it's, it's a way of being strategic about the deductions that are available um, and, and the timing of those um, all woven into your particular circumstance. The hey, other, um, Cheryl, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Cheryl, just a, a question came up about this when we were talking about stock. Uh -huh. um, Bernie asked, is a tax deduction at your cost basis or at the market value at the time of donation? Good question. Yeah. Right. Who, who wants, so, Bray, Bray, you want that? So if, if it's held long-term, Bernie, it's the fair market value uh, at the date the, of the gift. Yeah. That's the beauty right. of it. You're getting out of that cost basis trap. You're, yeah. That's the beauty of it. And the charity gets the full fair market value and you get the full fair market value as a deduction. Um, so particularly when there are capital gains baked in, um, the, the cost of making the gift is only, you know, maybe 75% of what the cost is is to you. You're actually giving a larger gift at a lower cost than than if you compared that to um, selling that asset and transferring the cash. Ali, this is actually probably a good moment before we move on to talking about IRAs to say um, for all the folks that are going to call their advisors and say, hey, do I have something that would be a good charitable gift? I want to support Pisgah Legal Services. Um, what is the, where do they get the information they need to provide to their advisor to get a transfer to you in a timely fashion before the end of the year? Yeah, good, good question. So for us, if you go to our website, piscalegal.org, there's um, a drop down at the top called Ways to Give. And there we have all of our instructions for stock transfers or QCDs, our tax ID number, kind of any of the information that you would need to make this type of gift to Pisca Legal. We have that on our website. Um, and you can also email me, Allie, A-L-L-Y at PiscaLegal.org, and I can send that to you. Um, we use Wells Fargo Advisors, and so we can give you our account number and DTC number to easily make that transfer. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for making it easy for folks to find that information. Let's talk for a moment about IRAs. Um, a couple years ago, we finally got some clarification. It was actually five years ago. We got clarification on something called qualified charitable distributions. That's a way that folks who are age 70 and a half or older can direct up to $100,000 a year from their IRA account to qualified charities. Um, it, it is a way of giving that can um, use your required minimum distribution and meet that requirement. That's not a 2020 requirement. We're going to talk about that nuance, um, but also make a significant gift uh, to charity from an asset that um, many, many, many people hold. By reducing the balance in your IRA, doing qualified charitable distributions may reduce your taxable income in future years. Um, it, it could have an effect on a taxable estate if you find yourself in that position. Um, and it can also uh, limit the beneficiaries. If you have people who are the beneficiaries of your IRA account, it can limit their uh, tax liability um, from that particular asset. One of the other things, and I'm going to invite Bray to comment on this as well, to think about is that um, again, we've had growth in the markets. So if your IRA is invested in a portfolio of stocks and mutual funds, you have probably some appreciation over the course of the year, maybe significant appreciation. If you're someone who decided because there was a special provision of the CARES Act not to take a distribution, a required minimum distribution from your IRA in 2020, you didn't need those assets to, to maintain your lifestyle and pay your bills, and you decided to leave those funds invested, it's coming to the time when your required minimum distribution for 2021 will be calculated. And it's calculated on the full value of your, of your IRA account. So you could potentially find yourself in a position 
with a much increased required minimum distribution in 2021 um, and some dilemmas around the increase in income that that represents. I want Bray to talk about that a little more and about when it might be a smart move um, to reduce an IRA balance before the end of the year. Thank you, I'm happy to. Um, I wanted to, if I can, just go back on the, the qualified charitable distribution, just a couple things we've seen just as a result of working with clients. Um, I love the qualified charitable distribution from the IRA. I think it's such a great tax tool. Um, but one little piece of that uh, is that one of the rules is uh, the, the, the qualified charitable distribution cannot come from what's called an ongoing IRA, meaning an IRA that's receiving contributions if it's uh, an employer IRA. So the very example of that is we had a client, he's a small business owner, uh, he's in his 70s, and he still has what's called a simple IRA with his business. It's called a simple IRA. And he uh, makes contributions to it, as does his business. And he wanted to do a very generous qualified charitable distribution to a local charity. And the rule is it can't come from an ongoing simple IRA. So um, ongoing means it's receiving contributions. So we couldn't use that in his case. Um, he did, however, fortunately have a traditional IRA, a separate account um, that was not ongoing and we could use that traditional IRA for the, for the qualified charitable distributions. So that's a little piece that you probably will only see if it impacts you. Um, the other thing I would say is if you're going to do a qualified charitable distribution to a charity from your IRA, especially if it's a small charity or, or a local charity, you might want to let them know it's coming. A few years ago, we found that uh, our office got all of the thank you letters <laughs> from, from the charities um, because they saw, in our case, the checks at Raymond James uh, in our address. And they assumed it was from us. And I, there was a little fine print, little memo line that says it was from a, a client client's IRA and that got missed and that can easily get missed. You got a lot of mail, maybe you got volunteers opening the mail at the charity. And so you do, I would, I would just say, let your charities know it's coming. So they'll be looking for it. So they thank you and they don't thank us. Um, with, with that said, I, so um, back to Cheryl's point. So if you don't take the required minimum distribution in 2020, because you're not forced to, uh, it will be, as we, I think we all know, will be back in place next year, which potentially means a larger RMD for you next year and moving forward because your account balance has grown if you were invested in some sort of diversified stock bond portfolio. It has actually increased, uh, likely increased, I should say, uh, this year since March. Uh, Congress, of course, didn't know that when the CARES Act passed, everything was down. No one knew what would come next. Uh, so, so yes, it very likely means larger RMDs starting next year. So I think that further incentivizes you perhaps to think about using the qualified charitable distribution this year, if it makes sense for you from the IRA to move some of that out of the IRA tax free. I, I think that's a really smart thing to think about. So let me offer one more IRA strategy for those of us who are uh, 59 and a half, um, but not yet 70 and a half. So there's about a decade of folks in there in that age range who can take penalty free withdrawals from their IRA. You can use those resources as you need them, um, but you're not required to take a distribution yet. For those folks, they may want to look at that IRA as a source to take a distribution, then give from cash. So you take that distribution, it will be income to you, but you can make a gift of cash and have the opportunity for that increased deductibility that we talked about before. All of this is about, first of all, your desire to do great things for the community, for organizations like Pisgah Legal Services that um, have been asked to do infinitely more um, with, with the barest increase in resources, if that, um, and to meet our neighbors who have been most affected by the pandemic and by the economic fallout of that. 
where they are and try to keep them safe and housed um, and cared for. Um, and so, so these are all, um, we're, we're talking a lot about tax and about assets and, um, and, and that, but at the core of it is the fact that some of us have the ability to look at our assets and discover um, with the help of our advisors ways that we can do more than we thought was possible. Um, and that is what the community needs right now. Um, I want to, Ali, are there any more questions in the chat before we kind of go on to looking ahead? Um, Not right now, so I think. And we are gonna open up, we'll all stop screen sharing and we'll all come together. So we'll have a time for questions and answers toward the end of the hour. Um, but let's, let's, uh, let's move forward um, as we, um, as we work through these to 20 to looking ahead to 2021 it, it is going to come it's going to be here <laughs> this this year is going to fade away um and and i want to turn it over to bray and jackie for a minute and um and ask them from your perspective as as uh advisors um when do you like to have conversations with clients about what they're thinking about um you know what's the what's the time frame for this looking ahead um, that is that you see work best for clients and for you um, in the largest sense. I'll jump in real quick and then hand it over to, to Bray. Um, our firm and every firm works different. We use the last quarter of every tax year to concentrate on charitable giving and tax planning. Now that's for tax, that's for gifts this year. Like I want so much to go to the church or so much to go to Pisgah Legal, whatever. Um, the, but some of the, you know, the bigger, you know, charitable arrangement, some of the more technical um, techniques that are out there need a long runway. I, we just talked to a, a new client and and mentioned the charitable remainder trust and they were like well that sounds so great let's go and i was like wow you know we got to have many conversations with the attorney with the cpa so it depends on the strategy i think the biggest thing for for donors are to say i am interested in in charitable giving help me figure out what my options are and then leave it to the advisors to work together to put uh, a plan together that's the best for you. Um, that's my kind of short, long answer, right? I agree. Um, and, and sort of the bigger picture questions, which Cheryl, I think you and your firm are focused on, those sort of big picture, like who are we as a person, who am I as a person, who are we as a family, what, how do we want our capital to be used in a charitable context? Those of course are year round conversations, uh, as we all know. Um, What's sort of funny is we, we have some clients who are very uh, plan oriented when it comes to the charitable giving and it's usually year end and they make a list and um, there's a lot of thought attached to it and then, and I'm guilty of this myself, there are some other folks who um, they'll receive something in the mail in March and um, write a check right away because it moves them. Um, so the charity did their job in that case, but um, so so to the extent possible, put a plan together for the charities that you care about. Uh, I know year end is the typical time to do it, but earlier in the year, start thinking about, start collecting those letters you're receiving. You don't have to give right away. I know the charity wants you to, but you can, you can start to think about it. Um, make your list of the charities that you feel are valuable for you and your family and, and and keep that list going throughout the year. And then, and then maybe at, towards the end of the year, develop a strategy about how to implement that list. Yeah. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about um, how to start to think about that list uh, in planning that extends uh, to the end of your lifetime and beyond. Um, and the first way of giving that is uh, more future focused that I wanna talk about is beneficiary designations. Beneficiary designations are the, typically it's the last page that you sign when you create 
uh, retirement account, uh, when you uh, buy a new life insurance policy. Um, there are a number of assets that are uh, your instructions about what should happen with that asset are controlled not by your will or by what you've told your family members, but by this piece of paper that's part of a policy or contract. Um, so the first task to, uh, that I'm going to assign is for folks to go and look at these. Take a look at them and make sure that your um, accounts that are controlled this way um, say what you want them to say. Sometimes things have changed in our families. Um, sometimes things are different in terms of the financial capacity of children or siblings. Um, and, and you kind of forget that that person was the person you put on that, on that line um, to receive that asset in the event of your death. Um, so the first task is to go and look and make sure it says what you want it to say. Um, the other thing that you can do is to consider making a charity one of the beneficiaries of, a, of an account like this. It's very easy to do. You use the same form that you use for people. Um, you can assign a percentage, um, a dollar amount. Um, you can um, make that contingent on um, being the person being first in line and the charity being second or in other ways. This doesn't affect, adding a charity as a beneficiary doesn't affect your ability to use those assets during your lifetime. It doesn't affect what a successor beneficiary who's named ahead of the charity will receive or their ability to use those assets. And it doesn't cost anything. Mo most of the time you can get to your beneficiary forms through your account online or your advisor can help you with that. So it literally, it costs nothing to add a charitable provision um, to these kinds of these kinds of resources, um, and and know that you haven't taken anything away from family that may need them, um, and, or that you are sharing with a charity a proportion of the resources that your family will also benefit for from. Um, again, this is retirement accounts, life insurance. Um, there, are, there are a number of kinds of accounts that are controlled this way, but for most of us, those would be the ones where these forms um, are, are most commonly used. Um, and particularly if you, uh, if you have old life insurance policies or the, um, I recently, I will confess, um, the retirement accounts that were established as part of my very first job I hadn't looked at the beneficiary designations mm -hmm. um, and, and I have now and I've changed. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, uh, that's just a reminder that, that, that um, all of us can do that. And it is a, it is a, a no cost, no risk way um, to potentially provide for a charity that you love or a cause that you love. The second thing, and this is what a lot of us think of when we think about gifts at the end of our lifetime is gifts from a will or a revocable trust. Um, and that is a way that people have been giving to charity for literally hundreds of years. Maybe you're a volunteer at Pisgah Legal. Um, maybe you're one of those wonderful people who sits and takes phone calls and then uh, directs people uh, who are in crisis to a lawyer who can help um, maybe you lend legal expertise. Um, maybe you're just someone who supports this work because of uh, the importance that you attribute it to, to it in our community's life. Um, I think about all the people who've been in the audiences, the audience to hear speakers like Marion Wright Edelman and Clint Smith, um, who've brought such important messages about justice and community um, to us uh, via Pisgah Legal Services. Um, and so adding a provision in this important document is a way that many people uh, like to provide for charity. Um, just like with beneficiary designations, you can give a specific amount um, or a specific asset. You can give a percentage. None of us really know what's going to be, you know, what's going to be there at the moment, at the moment that we leave uh, the earthly this earthly realm, but you can assign a percentage, maybe 10% of, 
um, has resonance for you because of uh, the tradition of tithing and your faith tradition. Maybe it's a different percentage based on, um, on what you believe is right and true. Um, you can also assign whatever's left over. Uh, the instructions in your will say to take care of people in this way. That's why we have wills, to take care of people in our lives. Um, you'll have some obligations that your executor will have to meet on your behalf um, unless you've balanced the checkbook and, and you know, you're leaving nothing but the last visa bill. <laughs> um, you'll probably have some obligations that need to be taken care of. Um, but you can also say, if there's anything left, whatever is left should be used for a charitable gift. And that's, uh, that's a way that, again, doesn't take anything away from the resources you have during your lifetime. Doesn't take anything away from resources that you believe your, your heirs um, or people you love will need, um, but does provide for charity um, if there's more than that um, at the time that, you, um, that you're no longer here. The other assets to think about are things that you own. Um, a house or a second house, a business, uh, art or collectibles. Um, I've got that Bitcoin symbol there because um, I don't know if anyone else has checked out of a virtual store using PayPal recently, but every time you use PayPal, you get an opportunity to buy Bitcoin. Um, it's uh, Bitcoin um, has exploded in value, as have some other virtual currencies. Bitcoin's the one we all probably know best. Um, but those are all assets to think about as resources for charitable giving at the end of your lifetime or perhaps before. But there are things that take a little more planning. Um, as Jackie said, you know, there's a little bit more of, a, of an on-ramp for these kinds of giving arrangements. Um, but these are all possibilities. And you don't have to give the whole thing. Um, particularly with businesses, you can give a portion of a business interest um, and have the proceeds from the sale of that benefit the charity of your choice um, or be integrated into a more complex kind of plan. Uh, Ray, Jackie, do you want to say anything about those, those couple of points as, as people think about their planning? Um, I'm sure that both of you all offer folks the opportunity to inventory their assets uh, when, they, when they become uh, a part of your firm. And um, even, if, even if no one's asked you to do that, it's a good thing to do um, because that can help someone like me or Bray or Jackie or the professionals you work with um, think in full about um, the assets you have and the goal, the philanthropic goal, as well as the family and other financial goals you want to achieve and match the best asset with the best strategy to create the most impact. Uh, Cheryl, we did have a question in the chat that I think is good about uh, beneficiary designation. Uh-huh. So please explain the tax benefits of giving at death from a taxable IRA via beneficiary designation as opposed to from cash in your estate. So could one of you take that question? Bray, I, I can do it, or Bray. Go ahead, Jackie. Well, so if you leave the IRA to, so if you leave the IRA to your um, heirs, that's going to eventually be taxable to them. If you leave the IRA to the charity, your state's not going to be taxed on it. Nobody's going to be taxed on it. The charity's going to get the full amount of it. If you um, give it from your estate, you're still your estate's still going to get a deduction. It's just going to work differently. That's definitely one of those where someone who's got your whole spreadsheet in front of them um, needs to take a look at the best at the best strategy. Um, and and maybe, maybe let's let's just because we kind of touched on it. Let's um, a little bit out of the order I envisioned, but. Let's talk about um, the IRA elephant in the room right now, which is that the rules changed and other, if, if, if other than your spouse and some other exceptions, those folks who inherit an IRA from you have to take the full value of the IRA um, as they have to withdraw that value um, over the course of a maximum of 10 years. We used to be able to do something called a, a, with an inherited IRA that was called, some people called it the stretch IRA. It meant that you could leave uh, your IRA to your children 
And they could then withdraw that value over their lifetime. So it meant that asset could continue to grow. They would have a resource um, for, for the balance of their lifetime. And that potentially you know, was, could be many decades. Um, now, regardless of the amount in the IRA and regardless of the age of the inheritor, they have to withdraw those assets over 10 years. Um, for folks with significant um, you know, IRA or multiple IRA accounts, um, or for folks with challenging situations with the folks that they want to support from those resources if they're gone, this rule change is, uh, has to be integrated into your planning. Um, and it may be, um, and I'll, I'll come around to this strategy, but it, it may be yet another opportunity to use a charitable tool to solve the problem of wanting an inheritor to have income over a lifetime as opposed to over that um, relatively short 10 year period. Bray, Jackie, do you wanna say anything else about that or should we come back just, around to it? Yeah, no, let me just quickly say what, what Cheryl was talking about, checking beneficiary designations. Um, we do that every year in our firm and, and that's another reason for doing that. You may have somebody and I Bray, Bray you guys have been dealt with this. You may have a child that's a beneficiary of, a, of an IRA that should have been the better planning would have been the spouse because the spouse does not come under the 10 year rule. So right. just checking the beneficiaries with your advisor and make sure that everybody understands what, you know, that that is the best beneficiary, whether it's a charity or a children or a spouse, but sorry. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I had that. No, I, I totally agree. And one quick beneficiary designation story, the importance of checking it. We had a client who received uh, proceeds from an IRA from a divorced spouse, they div she divorced him. He, uh, they each remarried. A lot of time passed. He died. He never checked his beneficiary designations. Instead of his current wife, it went to his ex-wife, um, not by choice, but by accident. So she had to, in this case, disclaim the uh, IRA proceeds. So it's important to check it. Either Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, um, I've won more than one lunch over a bet that people had ex-spouses still on their, IR, on their <laughs> beneficiary designations. Yeah. It's, uh, I had a little, I had a good, I had a good run for a while with that. Um, I want to talk about one creative giving strategy that integrates um, planning, um, a planning technique, um, thinking about family um, and, uh, and, and tax and financial benefits with a charitable impact. Um, it's a way of giving um, and there are really two strategies you can use here, uh, a charitable gift annuity or a charitable remainder trust. Um, this is the basic flow uh, represented on the chart. Um, you, the donor, you make a gift um, to, the, to one of these vehicles uh, during your lifetime. Um, you receive an immediate tax deduction. Um, you receive income payments for typically the rest of your life. Um, and your gift is invested and managed to create the flow for those income payments. Um, at the end of your lifetime, whatever assets are remaining become a gift to charity, to the charity that you've named in when you establish that gift. Um, it's, there are tax advantages. Um, there are char there's charitable impact. And often what we've seen is this is a way to take uh, an appreciated asset. Um, again, appreciated securities are the most common, but other kinds of things work, business interests, real estate. To realize the full value of that asset, reduce or, or eliminate capital gains liability, Often you're, you increase the income you're receiving because, uh, because you, you create an income stream from something that really was just a number, uh, just, a, just a holding in an account that wasn't, that wasn't creating any income. Um, and a charitable gift at the end of your lifetime. Charitable gift annuities in particular are extremely flexible. The payments are guaranteed 
um, for your lifetime. It's a fixed payment. So it operates in the context of your overall financial plan as a fixed income uh, investment. You know what you're going to get quarter over quarter, month over month. Um, and that payment does not change. Uh, so it's, it's, it's from a planning perspective, it becomes a kind of fixed star that you can then uh, manipulate other decisions around. Um, for charitable gift annuities, some of those payments are tax-free. Um, and I mentioned the flexibility. One of the things I really like about charitable gift annuities is you can make the gift now and you can actually delay receiving income payments. You can defer the beginning of those payments to another time. Uh, a scenario where we see that used often is someone who is coming to the end of their work life, but is still in their in uh, their peak or near the peak of their earning years. So they have a lot of income. Um, they're anticipating retirement, but don't know exactly when that's going to occur or when they when they'll when they'll want to pull the trigger on that. You can make this kind of gift now, have the tax benefit of the deduction, um, and then know that those payments are off and ready and waiting in the future when your journey to retirement is more complete. Um, or if your income is reduced for some, um, some other reason, you can turn those income payments on. Um, and at the end, um, of your life, then the remainder is uh, provided to the charity that you um, have chosen uh, for their work as a part of your legacy. So let me just give a quick example just to get some numbers in folks' heads. Um, let's imagine a couple. They're both 73 years old. Um, they decide to give in this way, they give $100,000, they'll receive a over $35,000 charitable deduction for that gift. And of the, I chose 100,000 because the math is easy. The payments back to them on an annual basis total $4,700. That's 4.7%, that's a set rate um, of 100,000. Um, and 11,000 of that 4,700, so about 25%, a little bit, a little bit less, is tax-free. It comes back, uh, you, you get a 1099 and it's, that amount is in that tax-free box. Uh, so this is a, these are gifts that can create um, really interesting planning opportunities. Um, charitable gift annuities in particular are not difficult or time-consuming to execute and they typically don't cost anything to establish. Charitable remainder trusts can be used for more complex assets or to address more complex situations um, or other kinds of planning parameters. They have a little bit longer of a ramp to establish. Um, but there are ways to create a number of um, positive outcomes that include charity. Um, and it's kind of part of the reason I do the geeky part of this work is I... I love to see these um, when you're getting check boxes in all the win columns for something that is um, ultimately going to create a charitable impact. Bray or Jackie, do you want to add anything, anything to that? I'll go. I, I do like charitable gift annuities a lot. Charitable remainder trust to the um, a decision point if you decide to go with the charitable gift annuity instrument is do I want to make the charitable gift annuity directly with the charity and, and many charities promote them and market them and administer them themselves or do I want to make the charitable gift annuity with some other entity like a charitable trust or a community foundation um, and why that matters is that if you do the charitable gift annuity directly with the charity uh, that's an irrevocable gift and so it's sort of like a marriage, like you're in it till the end. And so um, you want to pick a charity that you know you're in it with for the long term. Sometimes our feelings about charities change over time, whether the charity um, isn't doing as good a job as it once was, or the mission has changed, or you don't like the senior leadership 
And if you did the charitable gift annuity directly with that charity, you're, you're still locked in there. So that's, a, that's really something to think about um, when you do it. If you did it with a charitable trust or, or with the community foundation, you can change, in many cases, the charities over time. So if one upsets you, you can swap it out uh, for another one. So just, just part of the decision tree, I guess. Absolutely, absolutely. The next slide is gonna illustrate the concept that we were just talking about around inherited IRAs and this new rule. Um, that most inheritors, spouses are accepted, uh, will have to take all the assets out of an inherited IRA within 10 years. Um, and in bringing together the little bit of conversation we had before and uh, that discussion of charitable vehicles, um, that there are charitable ways to use, uh, charitable tools you can use to um, re reestablish uh, the provision of a lifetime of income um, to an heir as opposed to that 10 year time frame, um, And I don't think we, those are, those are, uh, this is a, this is a big planning conversation. And, and I think we, uh, I think we've, we've talked about it, but um, it, it, this rule change happened at the end of 2019. And I think many of us had our eyes on other things. Um, uh, this whisper about a virus that was, um, had emerged in Wuhan, China, and um, the beginnings of the news about that, and the holiday season, because this was passed into law on December 19th last year. So uh, many of us were already popping popcorn and drinking hot cocoa or something. Um, and this is an important conversation to think about if you have an IRA account that names uh, that names uh, non-spouses as beneficiaries um, along the way. Um, and advisors want to talk to you um, about this. Um, this last slide just shows you how to get in touch with all four of us, Allie, Jackie, Bray, and myself. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that those of you who want to can see a gallery view of all the folks that have joined us today. And we can... Um, we can, with the help of our technical team over at Pisgah Legal, um, help people um, unmute if they want to ask questions or continue putting your questions into the chat. Um, it is a real, it's just a real privilege to be here with all of you. I'm so grateful to Allie and to Pisgah Legal and to Jackie and Bray um, for, for putting this on uh, with, with me and for all of you. Um, we want to be resources uh, to you in every way, um, and we want to encourage your support of Pisgah Legal and the other organizations in our community that we simply cannot do without, and with, with, with neighbors who, um, who need them more than ever. Um, so with that, I am going to come out of screen sharing and Good come job. Back. That was really excellent. Um, there were, you know, we have a few more minutes and there's questions coming in. So let me jump in with one. Thinking about wills, do you need to last a charity, sorry, do you need to list the charities in your will or can you list them in a separate document that can be more easily changed? Who wants that? You want me to do that? You can do that one, yeah. Um, you, you don't have to, if you're not gonna list the charities in your will, then you do have to figure out a vehicle um, where the charitable assets can, can, can pour into um, or, and then be distributed according to some other set of instructions. Um, or if you, um, if you have an executor that you, uh, that you, that you trust, um, you can also give your executor that discretion um, and leave them some sort of instruction about the way you want those assets handled. Um, the executor is not, not bound by those instructions, um, but many of us would like to think our executors will do uh, what we want them to do and what we, what we instruct them to do. Um, your, uh, the attorney who's drafting your will or your other um, advisors are the very best people to, to help you with that. Um, and to, to help you figure out what works best for, what will work best for you. And then I think that you all answered this in the conversation, but just to confirm, when you're talking about the charitable gift annuities, um, are those life income payments tax-free income? 
a portion of each payment is tax free and and the, and that's uh, the the amount is determined by a um, by a, an algorithm um, that looks at the asset you've given um, and and it's its characteristics was it cash or was it an appreciated asset um, as well as your life expectancy um, and there are ways to um, I'm happy if someone's interested in that you, we can we can easily um, mock up those calculations and test various scenarios or your financial advisor can do that um, to to sort of see what that looks like for anyone's specific situation and it's going to look different for everyone's specific situation and the amount they're giving but yes a portion of the payments does come back to you tax free. What other questions do folks have you can. I'm seeing them in the chat, or if you want to unmute and ask these great panelists yourselves, please do so. Oh, it was so good to see a nice group like this, um, larger than, than last year. So, and great to see um, my colleagues and, and the donors and the staff at um, Pisgah Legal. It really is. It's... Um... It, it's been hard to be at home um, and I'm grateful for technology that lets us have at least this. Um, and again, grateful for the opportunity to just share these thoughts with you and encourage you to, um, to think about your own plans. Um, you know, I always think at the end of one of these sessions Sure, if someone is inspired to create a significant charitable gift, um, that's great. But if all that happens is someone really um, says, I really do have to get that will finished, or, huh, I should look at those beneficiary designation forms and make sure they say what I want them to say, that that is benefit enough, um, yep. that, that those steps are so important. Um, so that uh, your wishes are clear and correct. Um, and uh, that's, that's, that's really the first step for any of this. Sure. Um, and one question came in just about re the um, session being recorded and available later. And we did record the session, so I can send that out to folks um, as a follow-up um, so we can dig into some more of this information at our leisure because it was really helpful. I know I, for one, I'm going to go check my beneficiary designations <laughs> for my first job. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for that, Tim. Yeah, that was, that was a little embarrassing. I really encourage everyone to do that. Like, look at the oldest contract you have. Right. Um, so. Yeah, but I just want to say from all of us at Fiscal Legal, thank you so much to Bray, Cheryl, and Jackie. This was really helpful, um, really good information for all of us. And I appreciate you guys taking the time and thank everyone for joining us. It was, it was great to see folks from Hendersonville to Asheville and everywhere in between to be able to join us. And thank you guys for all you do for Fiscal Legal. We wish you a very happy Thanksgiving next week and um, a good uh, holiday season. So thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Bye. 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 Bye.